All right. Um, this is going to be um, API development in the cloud. I called it Gateways to Gateways because this is how I got started in serverless um, development. My name is Amy Arambolo Negret. I work for CloudReach, and that's a cloud consultant that does like migrations and app mod and all that fun, fun stuff. So what we're going to be talking about is um, basically what APIs are, hopefully quickly, and how to build them serverlessly, how to build them in AWS, all of that super fun servicey stuff. So who am I? I what, I've been in the industry for over 10 years, building APIs for a bunch of different industries, um, the biggest ones being Yahoo Fantasy Sports, um, NASA Ames, and currently at CloudReach, doing it for um, enterprise clients. So this can be anything from doing mobile backends, like I did over at Yahoo, to be doing like internal finance apps for to keep the research center running. So for a minute, let's talk about APIs. Who here works with APIs? <laughs> I expected there to be more. That was really weird. <laughs> because this, cause then the next like 20 minutes are going to be very confusing. Um, just so that we're all working with a shared definition that is technically, and I don't remember where I got this quote from, a system of tools and resources and an operating system that we use to create software applications. But realistically, what this means is any software application that is fetching requests and returning logic, either the application itself in full or the abstracted layer that's just the endpoints. That is the easiest definition that we're gonna go through today. Now for the nice, fun, fighty kind of definition, let's talk about serverless. Serverless computing is an execution, um, what? Execution model, where the cloud provider is responsible for executing a piece of code dynamically, allocating the resources. I've read this a dozen times. You would think I would remember what the words are by now. Um, this comes from the serverless stack, a really great tutorial on how to build serverless applications. and. This is also a great way to get anyone in a crowded cloud room that doesn't have any directions gate. So much, they're still servers because nerds love fighting over semantics. But what is it really and why is it important to us? It's an event-driven application design that uses cloud services. That's all it is. It, the reason why it's important is that it's fast. It's fast because you can prototype very quickly and that's it, you just, you have the things you need, you pick out the services you want, and you don't have to deal with things like security, or permissions, <laughs> or really trying to actually reach the thing that you need to get to that's outside of your environment. If you only need to test one part, you can test that one part pretty easily. I'm not saying to go build out production workloads that don't have security groups or anything because that would be insane and also it won't work because <laughs> they won't go anywhere. But still, if you want to build one thing and only test it within itself, you don't need to stand up a server to do that. You don't need to ask people. You don't need to ask people permission. Don't do that either. <laughs> There's, it's optimized because it's in the cloud provider's best interest to always keep their stuff fast and secure as far as their responsibility goes. You break something and you publish your keys, that's your fault, but for the most part, all the kernel level stuff they'll fix for you. They'll patch it, they'll make sure it's still up and running unless the entire cloud goes down and that's only happened twice this week. It's not a big deal. <laughs> and it scales. Um, when I say it scales, scales. If you are cool with your code being invoked a thousand times, once after another, then that's great. Then it'll scale like that. It scales out this way. If you need something to run for more than 15 minutes, it will not do that. It, 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 you run into a lot of problems, mainly that it'll tell you. It's like, I don't want to do it for this long, and I'm going to shut down and not tell you. And also, it's pay as you go, which is my favorite part, because I don't like paying for stuff. If you don't use your code during those weird prototyping hours where you're not really executing as well as you should, call fat time with your loved ones and sleep, you don't pay for those. And that's great because why, why would you pay for that? That would be crazy. 
So now when we're talking about API development that, are, that is in the cloud and serverless, we want to be able to basically build an application that takes requests, does some stuff with it, data stuff, behavior stuff, who knows, and then I'll do that without having to touch um, a on-premises da um, data store or server or whatever. So we have two paths we can go to as far as new development that does not include spinning up a server. One is containers. So another definition. Um, oh no, I wrote this one, good for me. Uh, containers are small streamlined little virtual machines that don't have a kernel in it. They just have the application code and it uses whatever code that it's running on. It's great if you're trying to standardize runtimes, which I'll get to later. As far as API is concerned, if you're building an API application inside a container, then you, you build all of your endpoints similar to as if you were using a PHP Slim framework or, or Flask, you would build that into the, into the container. You can spin it up and spin it out as you need it. So the good thing about this is that because you have everything containerized, in theory you can move it from machine to machine or cloud to cloud. And when you are talking to clients, a lot of them have, uh, is still very apprehensive about vendor lock because they don't, it's like, if I sign up with the service, I'm stuck with them forever. And it's like, yeah, but you're on-prem and you're stuck with them forever until you move. So it's really the same thing. It's the same decision process. It's usually because they've, they're having so many pains with that process, they don't want to do it again. And that's a completely reasonable thing to be concerned about. Also, when you do things within a container, theoretically, you do not need to upskill an ABI developer. So the person who's doing all of your application um, updates, who's building, and building out your Building out your services, you don't have to teach them one more thing because they, you just move them from a server to a container. And because it's a container, you actually have a lot of runtime control. Most anything where you don't want app developers really touching the kernel to begin with. So all of their dependencies and stuff, they can control, they can make sure everything's managed. Security can look in and say, hey, you didn't install any viruses on thing, that's great. So you have an ability to control and bless and standardize that. The problem is, as far as the maintenance and the cluster management, this is a problem where even though we say we don't have to upskill API developers, if they do this wrong, they can still break it. And if they break one, they break all of them. And that's a horrible thing, especially when you're dealing with junior, dev and, um, junior devs and they take down a cluster and they don't know how to deal with it. That's a lot of hand-holding that you have to do both emotionally and skill-wise. <clears throat> now, to my personal favorite, let's go serverless. As I said, it's just a bunch of stuff that you build on top of services, and that's it. It, one of the biggest problems is that it looks like this. It looks like a, con a huge architecture diagram and application developers do not like touching infrastructure. Not at all. It's, it's annoying and you feel like you're touch touching um, actual hardware even though you're not. No one's done that in a really long time. <laughs> but all of these services are triggered by things, by requests such as event queues, HTTP requests, um, time schedulers, and changes to data sources. And I went through the pros and cons of this already. Basically, it's cheap and it's fast, and that's the way I like it. The problem is when you try to bring the in, onboard this either onto a client site, which deals with legacy code that you don't own, or even within a product team that you're a part of and you have feedback, a lot of people, it's, it's different enough that it makes a lot of people very gun shy. Also, as I said, people are still very concerned about vendor lock. And if you deal with a migration plan, and if you've dealt with one migration plan to bring it to a cloud, it's basically the same plan to bring it to a different cloud. 
you can you can technically if you use like containerized services to go through a multi-cloud scenario as a backup but that is usually if if they think moving to the cloud is a lot of work that is like 20 times more work and that will scare a lot of people very quickly and again developers don't like touching infrastructure they don't don't know why it's because infrastructure is hard and subnets are just numbers and they don't mean anything hey. <laughs> i'm trying i'm trying to study it's okay <laughs> I'm learning, and that's what's important. <laughs> so let's talk about legacy APIs. Chances are, if you're dealing with an API that's been up for more than a month, it is now a legacy technology, and you have to support that until someone kills it. <laughs> this, th this is usually implies that it's someone else's design. It's someone else's motivation. And you kind of had to decipher that through the code if that person is not there anymore. When I was working over in public sector, we had to do things not just cheaply, but in a very dictated and planned sense where you are given a budget and a list of goals, and you had to do that because that was dictated by taxpayers. So trying to rebuild an app into a new space is a very difficult sell. What's really easy to sell is, this is exactly like the servers we have in that room over there, except it's in someone else's room. So lift and ship, you basically, you bundle your app, you throw it into a virtual se server, and you say everything is fine. Has the least amount of code changes, because there are no code changes, there's no upskilling, and since there's no upskilling, it's cheaper for your, for your, current, um, your current developers. The problem is that you pay per hour. Again, if you work in, if you work in the public sector, um, paying per hour is a huge pain in the butt because no one in the government works after six o'clock because the people won't pay for it. So you're paying for a lot of time that is not up. You can spin it down, but if you do not provide a path for someone to be able to log into that server and bring it back up because they need to do something in the middle of the night because something happened or someone's budget got changed or whatever, <laughs> then you end up having to leave that thing on and you end up paying for a lot of hours that you don't have. And because you are Managing it yourself, you lose all the optimization and basically the liability where someone, if someone else gets it wrong, the downage is their fault and you're the one who is left holding the bag. That's not great. And finally, this is, this I call modernization, but it's more of a strangulation pattern where you take your monolith and you slowly break it out piece by piece, once it's already in the cloud, into smaller services. This is the hardest sell, but this is also the most future-proof because you get all of the stuff that I talked about from a new development, and eventually you get to trash your old server, and that is a very cathartic experience. It does require an overhaul of all the software and all the hardware, but, so, but um, within three years, you're gonna have to do that anyway. Also, if you're, this sets into motion a plan of constant improvement of, of your application and your hardware, and that way none, no one gets a little too comfortable. Now we're going to go into the serverless part, which is my favorite. <laughs> Who's seen this before? <laughs> <laughs> so three people, because I heard the laughing. So th for those of you who have not heard, seen this before, this is an Uber-like app in order to order unicorns. And once you place the app in your, in place your choice in your app, it gives you an equal or greater value unicorn, drops it into whatever unicorn-friendly zone that you have near you so that you can take it to your unicorn-friendly destination. This is, the, this is the base of the serverless tutorial for AWS for like four of their tutorials and it's amazing. <laughs> if you have not tried it, you should try it because even, even the walkthrough is hilarious. I don't work on this, I'm just saying, it's fun. So we have an Uber-like app that involves unicorns. So what do those application requirements look like? 
It requires a database full of unicorns and states, requires authentication for users, a database of users, a history of actions, and of course the ability for users to order unicorns. That seems simple enough. That is just like a lot of apps out there. And I'm going to do the worst thing you can do, which is turn a serverless application into a monolith. If you turned it into a monolith, it would look like this, a very basic web server app where the server's on the bottom, database, app, authentication. That's fine, it's simple, it's one of the reasons why we stay with monolithic development is because it shows up easy on a diagram. So when you're trying to get people to pay for it and to plan your project, it's easier to get one thing approved as opposed to like six things that maybe six, maybe 20 you don't know yet. The only problem is this. this a server to run something like this would cost about $250 a month. It's not great. I mean, this is just your basic, lar basic T large. It's not anything special. But you have to keep it on all the time because you don't know when users are going to need a drunk ride unicorn. You don't know when that's gonna happen. It can happen at any time. It also does not include auto patching. If the things go down, people are going to go right over unicorns. There's always something that's going to go wrong. And if you are lucky enough to have both the fleet of unicorns and the demand for unicorns, it won't, uh, it won't adjust for scaling. So you hit, you hit your um, peak for whatever, re for whatever metric, whether it's like, whether it's time running or, or, your memory, or your memory wasn't set right, then the thing goes down and no one gets the unicorns and that's just sad. So this is what that app looks like. So this is why I bring it back to APIs. <laughs> so you have all your front end and your authentication up there. You have your API gateway and all of your back end code in the back. Again, it, it looks more difficult because it looks like these, since these services are spread out, you're buying more things, but you're buying more things at a much cheaper rate than buying one super huge thing just to say you have it on hand. And that's what these costs look like. So API Gateway is $3.50 per million requests after your first 330 million requests. If you are prototyping, that is amazing. If you're trying to get a product to market, that is amazing. It's also super cheap. And if you look over there, um, I got this screen cap from serverlesscalc.com. It's a great service. You it, you basically plug in your requirements and it tells you how much it is. $3.70 um, per request after, after, two million, after two million requests. That's not bad at all. So if you're building these APIs and applications, what do you really need? First thing, you need version control. Um, I don't know about you, my kid dumped a cup of water into my fans once and I lost everything on that machine. You don't want to do that. The first thing when you start any project is open a repo just so you have some place to dump everything and you probably do that automatically but to each your own. The problem is since you're dealing with different services, it's very hard to keep track and that's where infrastructure come, as code comes in where you can deploy um, cloud native resources as JSON or YAML definitions depending on what service you're using. And these definitions can be tracked in Git, and that's usually the way I do it. AWS has a, an internal service called SAM. Uh, they, it also has a really cute mascot, that's a squirrel. So SAM is, um, is application management, and it has definitions that look like that where you basically list out all your functions, all your resources, it'll deploy it into a CloudFormation stack that you can redeploy and update from the console and you can see it in the console instead of just having it in, in, your, um, in your definitions. You can also take this, you can put it into, um, what is, uh, code commit, there you go. If you put it into code commit, it will automatically deploy into, into Amplify. So it, you, you can serve all of your serverless stuff, your entire app, without, like I said, paying for time that you're not using. Another form of um, 
These kinds of inversion of control is Terraform, which a lot of people I've heard are familiar with. They're really good at doing multi-cloud resources, which is great, especially if you're dealing with a customer that has a lot of different resources in two different clouds and they do not overlap. So if you need to, you can standardize IAM roles this way and get, and you can do an IPSEC bridge, which is what I had to do, it's not great, but it's a solution. The only problem with this is it's defined in HCL, which is HashiCorp's proprietary language, and it does not deploy into a CloudFormation stack. It calls the API, the AWS API for every single definition. And one thing that takes longer, and another thing is you, you don't have that nice display and you can't monitor it from the CloudFormation stack anymore. You have to maintain your own state, and maintaining states when there are a dozen people working on something, having to do that manually is a headache. <laughs> There are, there are like standard practices on how to do it through like DynamoDB tables, but still, if you can avoid doing it, you probably should. <laughs> this leads me to the serverless framework. Serverless framework is really good in that it does a lot of what SAM does, except it doesn't do all services. It only does very specific serverless services, like, um, like Lambdas or API gateways or Dynamo, Dynamo tables, it'll deploy most of those. What it won't do is deploy queues for some reason. I don't know why. And they keep saying they're going to work on it. But the reason why this is important is because serverless is also multi-cloud. So if you need to connect two things between Azure and AWS or GCP and AWS, then this will allow you to build those resources much easier and then trying to go through like Terraform where their definitions are there, it's just extremely difficult. And another thing about Terraform is that if you change your Lambda code, you have to redeploy the entire stack and you have to force it because it won't detect that change. Because it only detect, it does not detect like zip changes, which is awful. <clears throat> uh, maybe, it, it, maybe that was only when I was using it, but I'm not sure. And Again, all of these definitions, because they're um, in external files, can be checked into Git or code commit or whatever, Bitbucket, whatever service you're using. I guess Bitbucket is good. So another thing is everything runs all the time, right? Everything runs, nothing goes down, all of our dependencies are always there. Of course they are, but just in case they aren't in the off chance, they, um, Amazon has layers, which allows you to drop in libraries for things that you don't have. Um, I've seen people use this to load up PHP in PHP runtimes within, um, within Lambda, which is great because they'll never support it. And the only caveat to this, I would say, is that the package size, it does count against your package size, so you just need to make sure that whatever library you built to be shared between your apps is not overly huge. But if you're trying to do something like connect to an SFTP server because someone really, really likes SFTP servers, you can, you can put the, um, SS, the SSH protocol in there because it is not included in Lambda for some reason. Who knows why? <laughs> you know what you also need? An answer for why it went down. Not saying it did go down, but you need to be able to tell a customer why whatever target that they're hitting, or whatever change they made, was not your fault. Here we have um, screen caps of AWS um, CloudWatch and X-Ray. They are, they are lots of numbers and lines. They're not, super, they're not super user friendly and it takes a long time to find the information you want. I'm not super thrilled with it, and super thrilled with this service and I have made that known many times. <laughs> But if you want something that's a little bit clearer, a little bit easier for support to use, because at the end of the day, you're not using, you're not using these monitoring tools. DevOps and support is using these tools, and they need to know why they shouldn't be calling you. So there are other tools that if you just drop them in as a library or as an agent, they'll, they will populate the, the right metrics, 
such as Epsigon or Datadog. Um, Datadog just reads CloudWatch logs and CloudTrail, while um, Epsigon you add as a layer, and it'll do all of this automatically. And it's a m much more user-friendly interface, especially if you're dealing with a multi-cloud environment, that you can send to either a support team or a product owner and say, hey, look, you can, and it's like, you can see when it went down. It was nothing I did because I didn't make any changes. Someone at the other end and probably made a change and you should call them at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I'm okay. I sleep fine. So, this was really fast, but what we did, what we were able to cover was how to build new ABIs and how to migrate them. Um, we actually did break apart a monolith a little bit. Uh, we went over the different types of options for um, infrastructure as code and how to control your runtimes and monitor those resources. These are all really important parts of trying to keep not just serverless applications, but any application really running. And it really helps when you're dealing, when you're um, accidentally finding those limits, like the fact that Lambda has a 30 second um, ceiling when you attach it to API Gateway, which was a fun thing to find out basically after I deployed. So that is all I got. If you have any specific API or serverless questions, I will be glad to answer them because I can literally talk about this all day for, or for at least another 15 minutes. <laughs> If not, I have feel, I have asked for questions beforehand, so I can feel I can pretend that someone asked more questions. <laughs> okay, what to do in case of vendor lock? So when you're dealing with vendor lock, um, one of the questions I got when I asked my various communities on Slack what they wanted to know is why can't I move out of the cloud? Um, Google actually has a has a service for moving those types of um, those types of services, not just into GCP because obviously, but in and out to other clouds such as AWS and Azure. I think Azure's also working on one, and I'm pretty sure just because everything is in the pipeline for AWS, they may have announced it today. Who knows? I didn't check the news yet. Oh, this also this one time I did a serverless presentation, and they re-released the best practices guide two hours before my presentation. So that was a fun last minute change I had to do. Um, okay, more. You can actually use, use API Gateway for more than um, RESTful APIs. You can actually use them for WebSockets and create, um, this is good for either chatbots, Slack bots, um, data streaming, so there's a way to do that and you can hook it directly to a Lambda, so a Lambda reacts to every change and that is when you'll have that kind of thousand invocation issue. Not saying, there is a hidden limit of um, Lambda invocations, but for the most part, you should be able to keep doing it until you get an email from Amazon as to why they shut you down. And let's see, um, there's, a, oh, I also got a question about whether or not you could use GraphQL. You can fire, use Lambdas to fire off Graph, GraphQL requests. And there is actually a library or, um, or a Lambda or an open source Lambda in the repository that you can just add to be able to make those um, GraphQL requests. Pretty sure of it, I think I saw that. And those are my pre-formatted questions. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, question. Yes. Uh, you know, come in, you come in, the build may be 100,000 API, maybe, maybe 100,000. Yeah. Like a big bank. They're talking about domain, domain driven design, called DDD, right? Yeah. So make sure which API fit in which domain, subdomain. Right? Yeah. Those kind of projects are stand out of Yes. Come under this stand, right? Yes. Yeah, um, when, okay, so when I, when I did this talk over at API Docs, I included um, a thing about Netflix's um, API gateway called Zool, because everyone thinks they're funny. Um, so one of those things, those massive API gateways um, requires a service mesh, so you have to implement that. 
Also, you have to be aware that there is a 300 resource limit on, a, on API Gateway endpoints. So it's not just like the number, the types of requests where it's like get, post, whatever. And it doesn't count that, but it does count like every, like everything, for every slash you get like 300 of those, right? So you have, you have to pre-plan one of those things like that. Um, and when you do that, as far as having it being domain driven, is you just, if you prefix the thing in your account with your, whatever your, your base domain name is, then that should cover a lot of your requirements for that. Um, what I don't suggest is what someone suggested to me, which was like normalize all of the data coming in. It's like all of your requests are not gonna be the same. We're not talking about just digesting data. It's like if you are dealing with things that are either like metrics are different than say and then say report than reports you don't want them in the same place because then they'll touch each other and that seems weird to me but also it makes things like normalization very difficult also it makes your table super large when it doesn't have to be and makes scanning take it requires a very long time to scan uh, so when you do one of those super large Netflix like projects you it's like you you assign a a base for for every um, business unit, and then uh, then what they do is um, they have basically a transitive a transitive service that says if you're coming off of these stubs, then you go hit this API, and then it um, postpends all the stubs. Um, what a question is like a. You, you have one API you know, file in the domain, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you have one uh, query on it to be filed in the domain, mm -hmm. to be choose the back. Mm -hmm. So do one API call the domain, just call one API to this domain, get a key, the other domain call another API? Right? You mean? Yeah. You probably need to call four API to get the data back on across the domain. Um, this is maybe one database, like a query to the table. Yeah. Five table in your domain to get the result back, right? Yeah. It's a simple query. Right now, you need to get a four or five API. Yeah. Those API you need to call one, another one, call another one. That's yeah. a lot of work. Yes. So there are, like, um, serverless is not a catch all solution, just like nothing is a catch all solution. So if you're doing that many joins and, and like, and basically um, uh, data transformations, and you're combining that many data sources, you want something something behind one of your endpoints to handle all those services, okay? So you basically want either a container or, because you can put a container cluster at the end of an endpoint, and it'll do basically the same thing, and that would actually handle some of, you, some of your requests. Um, but if you want, if you have like a really large wing and they want to be able to have all of their things touch each other, then you would just throw a server at the end of that one, at the end of their sub, to be able to handle it. Anything else? Did that did that answer, did that help at all? Okay. Anything else? Okay, and then that's it. Thank you.